Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so called experts get it wrong. This week, we continue our coverage of the nuclear nightmare in North St. Louis, where a Superfund site containing 72,000 tons of illegally buried World War II era Manhattan Project nuclear waste is in the path of an underground fire that has been burning for five years. We hear first from Ed Smith of the Missouri Coalition for the Environment on current legislation pertaining to this situation and what we can do to support it. And then we get an update from the moms with Dawn Chapman, an admin with the Westlake Landfill Facebook page. Plus, our regular Num Nuts of the Week, Nuclear Regulatory Commission Duck and Cover Report, activist shout outs, a very special final thought based on what I shared in that same spot two weeks ago, and more nuclear information than the COP21 Climate Change Summit in Paris is allowing in its main forums. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 1st, 2015. And here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. For those watching the COP21 climate change negotiations in Paris, know that according to an announcement by the World Nuclear Association, the nuclear industry is promoting 1,000 gigawatts of new nuclear capacity as being necessary to support climate change. Know that their talking points have been planned, the articles coordinated. Their presence orchestrated, and they will do anything to win. To be continued. Interesting series of articles about Australia have been showing up. On October 16, 15 tons of nuclear waste sailed from France for Australia, despite protests from environmental campaigners who said they were concerned about deficiencies in the vessel. It made it there on time on November 27th. But then the question arises where does all that waste go? Well, in March of 2015, Australia called for nominations of sites from any landholder, quote, to store Australia's intermediate level radioactive waste and dispose of low level waste. 28 sites were nominated. It's down to a short list of six in three states and the Northern Territory, and a decision is expected by the end of 2016. The new storage facility is expected to be ready by 2021. But there are protests. At Sally Flat in Australia, which is 216 kilometers or 162 miles northwest from Sydney, one of the nuke waste dump sites still under consideration is right next door to a hereditary family of merino sheep farmers who fear that raising sheep next to a nuclear waste dump could put their livelihoods at risk, and they are not being quiet about it. Ironic because the owners of the sheep farm, the Rayner family, had just signed up to become a sustainable operation and had to meet stringent criteria. Now they say, what will we do? You can't just pack 2,000 sheep up and move. And Australian indigenous groups pulled out of Sydney's climate march when nuclear power came to the party. Redfern Aboriginal Tent Embassy and SOS Block Australia Sydney boycotted the march, claiming the Aboriginal community didn't support the nuclear movement. There are currently plans to dump nuclear waste and mine uranium from traditional lands, which are also connected to forced community closures. We are working on a full report from Australia on all the situations there and hope to have it for you early next year. In the UK, cracks have been discovered in bricks, which make up the core of one of two nuclear reactors at the Hunterston B power station in Ayrshire. But owner operator EDF Energy says not to worry because the cracks appeared as expected. Like that makes a difference? The facility is 39 years old and its working life has already been extended to 2013, well beyond its planned closure date. 65 Canadian and U.S. public interest groups have sent a joint letter to the Canadian Federal Minister of the Environment and Climate Change 
urging her to reject Ontario Power Generation's bid to bury radioactive wastes right beside Lake Huron. A decision statement is due by December 2nd under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. Here in the U.S., we will catch up with the Westlake landfill during our interview segments. In addition to Westlake, the nuclear industry's dirty little secret, radioactive waste, keeps popping up. On November 19th, a tractor trailer carrying radioactive hazmat suits from Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania crashed in Maryland near Hagerstown. The state of Nevada has warned the federal government that radioactive well water contamination could threaten some 1,400 people in a rural farming community if federal regulators allow the nation's deadliest nuclear waste to be buried in the Nevada desert at Yucca Mountain. Tennessee officials have been raising concerns about the U.S. Department of Energy's plans for a new nuclear landfill at Oak Ridge, which is already a Superfund site. A newly introduced House bill would amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 to authorize the Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz Moniz, to enter into contracts for the storage of high-level radioactive waste and spent nuclear fuel. This opens the possibility of building a temporary, quote-unquote, there's nothing temporary about nuclear, but what they're calling a temporary high-level nuclear storage site in rural West Texas, something which previously was not permitted by law. And the Energy Department has proposed a 17-year delay in building a complex waste treatment plant at its radioactively contaminated Hanford site in Washington State, pushing back the full startup for processing nuclear bomb waste to 2039, as opposed to the current deadline of 2022. Over to Japan, where in Fukushima Prefecture, 11 people aged 18 or younger at the time of the 2011 triple meltdown of the nuclear reactors there, were recently diagnosed with thyroid cancer, bringing the number of confirmed cases to 115 since the accident began on March 11, 2011. In a possibly related story... The government officials of Kamakura City, which is 350 kilometers or 217 miles from Fukushima, measured 171 becquerels per kilogram of cesium from the earth of a playground of an elementary school. They collected samples at 25 elementary and junior high schools, and cesium-134 and 137, the signatures for Fukushima, were detected at 22 of the 25 schools. The underground wall around the Fukushima reactors has started leaning with cracks of up to about one centimeter in the seawall. Not exactly holding back the water, guys. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. In Minami Soma, in Fukushima Prefecture... A research headquarters opened on November 16 to monitor radiation levels from the stricken Fukushima nuclear power plant around the clock. Sounds good, right? But listen to the statement from Fukushima Governor Masao Uchibori. He said, The center will conduct more minute and precise radiation monitoring and release accurate data to the public to dispel the anxiety of Fukushima residents and negative publicity about radioactive contamination. There you have it. It's the admission that this is not about science. It's about propaganda. The concept is compromised from the start. In addition to prefectural officials, around 15 workers of the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, yeah, they're going to be neutral, staff the facility on a full-time basis to provide their spin, uh, can't, uh, quote-unquote, expertise in developing monitoring methods. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they're going to be really creative when it comes to developing those monitoring methods, since they already know what their marching orders are and what they are supposed to find. And that's why research headquarters to monitor radiation levels in Minami Soma you and everybody who runs you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. 
We'll have this week's featured interviews in just a moment. But first, today is Giving Tuesday. It's time to give back to the organizations that represent your beliefs and thoughts. If you wish to make Nuclear Hot Seat the recipient of your giving, to support the work of bringing you the most up-to-date, verifiable information on nuclear issues around the world, we would sure appreciate it. To donate, go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. And if you prefer to not donate online, you can email info at NuclearHotSeat.com for a snail mail address where you can send your donation the old-fashioned way. Whatever you can do to help, it's appreciated and we thank you. West Lake Landfill is a Superfund site in North St. Louis that contains 72,000 tons of illegally buried World War II-era Manhattan Project nuclear waste. Even worse, that rad waste is in the path of an underground fire that has been burning for five years and cannot be put out. During that time, the past five years, the whole shebang has been under the supervision of those so-called experts at the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. On November 19, a bipartisan group of Missouri politicians, Republican Senator Roy Blunt and Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill, along with Representatives William Lacey Clay and Ann Wagner, again a Democrat and a Republican, these four proposed legislation in both houses that would allow the Army Corps of Engineers to take over remediation of the Westlake landfill under a program that already exists, the formerly utilized Sites Remedial Action Program, otherwise known as FUSRAP. To bring us up to date on what's happening with the Westlake site, Nuclear Hot Seat today has two interviews. First, we hear from Ed Smith, who is with the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, on the proposed legislation, what we can expect from it, and what each of us can do to support it. Ed Smith of the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having me. Start out by telling us a little bit about what the Missouri Coalition for the Environment is and does and how long it's been around. Yeah, so the Missouri Coalition for the Environment was founded in 1969 by a really great group of environmental pioneers in law, education, and conservation. And from there, we have focused on food, water, and energy issues throughout the existence of our organization. Open spaces as well uh, are very important. And one of our co-founders, Leo Dry, his wife Kay Dry, has been a longtime anti-nuclear activist and longtime concerned citizen regarding the radioactive materials in St. Louis that were spread around as a result of the processing of uranium for the Manhattan Project and beyond into the Cold War. So it sounds like you've been aware of the problems with the radioactive waste for quite a while now. Does that include Westlake and the problems at that landfill? Yes. Kay Dry has been focused on the Westlake issues since the, the 90s. And, you know, we've been trying since then to get the Westlake landfill site transferred to the formerly utilized sites remedial action program, which was created by Congress to clean up nuclear weapons sites around the country and remove radioactive materials from the human environment. What has been your level of success or frustration through these years? Well, there's been a lot of both. We'll start with the frustration, and that's the fact that there was significant political support for the removal of the radioactive materials. The city of Bridgeton, where the landfill is located, did not want to see the radioactive materials stay there. They passed a resolution saying as much. There was an extended period for comment opposing the EPA's proposed decision between 2006 and 2007, and ultimately in 2008, the EPA decided to cap and leave the radioactive materials at a landfill never designed to store them in the floodplain of the Missouri River with no liner separating the radioactive materials from the groundwater. So the fact that these radioactive materials are going to become more radioactive over the next 9,000 years and not less radioactive 
due to the, the chemical processing the materials went through, it's going to be a very hot spot for the next hundreds of thousands of years. And so leaving the radioactive materials there really presents a, a long-term threat to the drinking water of our region. And most importantly, we have found out that there's been historic fires at the site, and now that there's a smoldering landfill fire, the threat of a fire impacting the radioactive materials is something that we're very concerned about and something that, that we know the EPA did not even consider in its 2008 decision to cap and leave the radioactive materials there. So that is, you know, that's been a frustration. And as far as success, uh, our organization was helpful in getting the EPA to reconsider that decision. And so in 2010, the EPA agreed to review its 2008 record of decision, which was never implemented. That review process is ongoing. The EPA expects that it will have a decision by the end of 2016. Another success we have is, again, as I stated earlier, we want the, the Corps of Engineers formerly utilized sites remedial action program put in charge at Westlake. And just last month in November, we had bipartisan legislation introduced by Missouri delegation in the Senate and in the House to do exactly that. I want to move on to the legislation now. It was introduced by a bipartisan group of both of your senators to the United States Senate, both McCaskill and Blunt, and also Representatives Correct. Clay and Wagner. And in both those instances, they're both Republicans and Democrats represented. But the legislation was submitted on November 19, which was right before the congressional Thanksgiving break. What can you tell us about the legislation itself and what has happened thus far in the two weeks since its introduction? What's happened in the two weeks since its introduction is that the bill has been introduced and read in both houses and referred to their respective committees. That's where, as they say in the Beltway, the sausage is made. And if we can get it out of committee, which is that's our next goal, we want to get it on the floor for an up or down vote. We want the process to work here. The good thing about Westlake is that this is not a uh, political platform of either party. Westland Landfill doesn't fit into the tax and spend debate or abortion or energy or anything like that, which is why we've seen bipartisan support for it here in Missouri. And hopefully the rest of Congress will, will recognize that and be able to move this forward without some of the problems we've seen with Congress passing bills over the last several years. Right, because this is a public health issue. This is not a political issue. It will impact everyone in that area and potentially far beyond. There's one piece of the legislation, though, that I found troubling. And here I quote directly from it, that nothing in subsection B, it just is a technical thing there, nothing in subsection B creates liability for contamination at the site or, and this really rankles, any actions or failures to act by any past, current, or future licensees, owners, operators, or users of the site. This looks like a giant get-out-of-jail-free card. What is that phrase? What are those phrases doing in the bill at this time? Yeah, well, that's something we're going to have a lawyer look at. But what I've read, when you look at the entire bill together, it really appears that what they're doing is just shifting the legal jurisdiction of who's in charge and moving forward under CERCLA, which is a super fun law, uh, which the Corps of Engineers, who's rep, follows CERCLA, their cleanup sites as well. That needs to be further investigated with a legal eye. Those were the parts that were recently updated to the bill that, that we need to figure out exactly what those implications mean. When well, last I looked... The bill was posted online on the congressional site, but it did not even have a summary in place, which is, of course, one of the earliest steps in attempting to gain passage. Now that we're heading into the Christmas and New Year's holidays with a congressional recess that begins on December 21st, what are the chances that the bill can gain any traction and action or even pass before the end of the year? I'm not going to speculate about what Congress can do before the end of the year. You know, our goal is to engage the folks on the committee, make sure that we're getting our voices heard. There's been 
a lot of opposition from Republic Services, the landfill owner, to this bill. They started running radio advertisements in uh, St. Louis and mid-Missouri opposing this legislation. If that part that you were mentioning earlier was a get-out-of-jail-free card or get-out-of-paying-free card for Republic Services, I don't think they'd be running radio ads against this bill. This brings up the question, is it realistic that this bill can pass in time to provide who's rep the chance to come in and make a difference to the people of North St. Louis, given not only the radioactive waste, but the encroaching fire? Yes. First of all, our goal is to get this passed before the presidential election. We think that's doable. This is the best shot that we have to get an independent second opinion about what should be done with the radioactive materials at the landfill. It's our opinion that they should be removed, but putting the Corps of Engineers in charge doesn't guarantee the removal of the radioactive waste. But the Environmental Protection Agency has dropped the ball too many times at this site for them to put forth a decision that is going to be accepted by the community given their past problems at this site. Couple that with the fact that All of the radioactive sites in St. Louis related to nuclear weapons, radioactive materials are under food wrap, except for Westlake Landfill. Just from an administrative perspective, it would be better to have all of the sites under the same Department of Energy Office of Legacy Management, ultimately, when these sites are cleaned up, instead of having some with the EPA, some with the Corps of Engineers or the DOE, ultimately. Administratively speaking, it makes sense to have all the information at one spot regarding the radioactive sites in the St. Louis area. Nuclear Hot Seat has a large listenership, an international listenership. If the listeners are motivated to help, which so many of them are, what can they do? In the United States, I would suggest that you contact your congressperson and both of your senators especially if they're in the committees that the bills were assigned to, which in the uh, Senate, it's in the Committee on Environmental and Public Works, and in the House, it's in the Subcommittee on Water Resources and Environment. Look up those committees, see if your congressperson or your senator is on those committees. That's the next step. But regardless, they should be contacting their federally elected officials and asking them to support H.R. 4100 and S. Two three zero six. Both can be found on Congress.gov. And if people wish to follow any updates from the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, where can they go to receive that information? Go to our website, Mo Environment, M-O Environment.org. We have an entire section dedicated to what's happening at the Westlake Landfill. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and folks can sign up for emails specifically about Westlake Landfill that we send out. And I'd also encourage people to join the Facebook group, Westlake Landfill, run by the moms, Just Moms STL, where information is updated daily, way more than the emails that we send out. Ed Smith. Thank you so much for your assistance in this, and do keep us in the loop so that the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat can have the most up-to-date information about what's happening at Westlake. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. That was Ed Smith of the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. You can learn more by going to the group's Facebook page or their website, moenvironment.org. Next, we talked again with Dawn Chapman, who is our guest on Nuclear Hot Seat 227. She is a mom who lives within two miles of the Westlake Landfill and who volunteers as admin for the highly informative Facebook site, Westlake Landfill. Dawn Chapman, thank you so much for being my guest again this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Hi, (laughs) Libby. Sounds like you've been awfully busy with what's going on with Westlake. It it has been insane. I have literally sat in this chair now for five hours straight today on conference calls, manning social media, making other phone calls, and and it's the holiday season, so obviously it's crazy because of that for other reasons, but this issue has really started to peak. I'd like to explore what that peak looks like from your perspective. First of all, What has been happening since November 19 when the 
bipartisan senators and congressional representatives from your area filed legislation in Congress to have Westlake put under the Army Corps of Engineers Foods Wrap program. The best way to describe what has happened since uh, our four congressional delegates introduced legislation to move it to Foods Wrap is we've come under heavy fire from all angles from the corporations. Every strategy, every PR strategy imaginable that's been used in situations like this across the nation and other situations is being deployed on this community right now, and it's very difficult to fend it off. I think the most important thing is the legislation that was sponsored, it took us three years to get that. We achieved that through education and through meetings, and really pleading our case over and over, having to disprove EPA documents, having to show math errors in EPA documents. You know, one of the things that we've had to educate these elected officials on is the fact that the EPA has had several math errors in their documents. There are documents with cover letters that say one thing, and the actual 800-page document says something completely different. These are things that take time when you're meeting with somebody. You know, no elected official in their right mind is going to read through an 800-page document. Basically, a mom has to go sit in front of one of their lawyers or their policy advisors and walk them through the mistake. That takes time. We have gotten all of our elected officials to agree that the accumulation of errors at this site by EPA is so numerous and that this site is so botched that it really does need the Army Corps of Engineers and their Foos Rat program to come in and take a fresh look at this site and figure out what in the world should happen. Do you think those mistakes are based on the EPA's incompetence, or might there be an intentionality behind it? You know, I'd go both ways on that. Um, some of it seems so ridiculous, some of these mistakes, and at the same time, others – I'm sorry, hold on one second, maybe. Go, go ahead. We'll, we'll just restart your answer. Not a problem. I know. We're going to use that I'm, I'm so sorry. That was my husband real quick. I apologize. <laughs> oh, it's only your husband. Life goes on here. Life goes on here. <laughs> which, no, which, um, which is the way it should be. And let's take a beat. And the question was whether uh, you think the mistakes were based on the EPA's incompetence or whether there was some aspect of intentionality to it. I go back and forth on whether the mistakes were deliberate or not or it was incompetence. I mean, overall, I don't care. Those mistakes have consequences. But in the back of my mind, I think it's a little bit of each. And I think that one of the main problems is that some of these documents are very old. And these people who read them, they're not in the job very long. They leave. The next person comes in. No one person has read everything on this landfill. It's simply not possible. But at the same time, they did pass a record of decision at this site in 2008 that was then abandoned because they didn't consider all options. You know, all these mistakes that I'm talking about were found after 2008. They were found within the past three years since Karen and I became involved in this issue. That is a real scary thought that we could have had a record of decision that was already implemented on a site that wasn't fully characterized. And what does a record of decision consist of? What should that 2008 record of decision lead to? Well, you know, the 2008 record of decision was to cap the site with three feet of clay and rock. So basically, put that over the top of radioactive waste, even though much of it is still sitting in the groundwater. The National Remedy and Review Board, which is EPA's own review board, if you will, that reviews it when the cleanup at these sites hit a certain level, it triggers that review board to come in and look at it, and they determined that not all the options for what to do with the radioactive waste at this site were even looked at or considered. The important thing about that is not only were all the options not considered, but not once, not once did they ever consider a landfill fire to be a risk. And obviously we have a giant one burning right now and has been for five years. That is an epic mistake to make. Again, when the EPA looked at long-term what solutions should happen at this site with the radioactive waste, as a risk, they never looked at the possibility of a landfill fire occurring 
And the reason that is so erroneous is because this fire that's burning right now that everyone's talking about, this is the third fire. Really? We had two previous fires at this landfill. These are underground fires at the landfill. We have had two previous ones. None of them self-sustained and became as big as this one. They all burned out and fizzled out within a year or two or a couple of months, according to the documents. These other fires occurred under EPA's watchful eye at their Superfund site. When EPA made the decision to throw rock and dirt and some clay about three feet worth over the top of this radioactive waste and call it a day and walk away from this site and leave it there for all eternity like that, they already knew that this site had a history of two other fires. That should have been considered in a risk. These fires start in landfills. Everybody knows that, and yet it was never considered a possibility. And hence, now as we sit here, 2015, we are in a situation where we just so happen at that same landfill now to have a fire six football fields wide, 250 feet deep, burning within a 1,000 feet of this radioactive waste. This situation, this landfill, these fires, this could have been avoided by EPA. The first fire they had in this landfill in 1992 and another in 1995, when that happened, it should have triggered an alarm in the back of the Environmental Protection Agency's head that said, hmm, we have the potential for something very dangerous to happen at this landfill. And yet, in 2008, they decided it would be okay, let's leave it there, throw some dirt on top of it, walk away, it can stay there for eternity, it can soak in the groundwater, nothing will happen. If you read the press release that our congressional delegation released with the legislation they introduced, Senator Roy Blunt, a Republican, said EPA has destroyed its credibility with this community. That is one of a hundred reasons why. You get no argument with me about EPA's incompetence because that's been about the most striking and consistent aspect of the Environmental Protection Agency is the extent to which it does not protect the environment and indeed seems to be on the side of the polluters whenever possible. Be that as it may, I'd like to look again at this legislation. Now, given how slowly Congress operates and the fact that we're at the end of the year, they go on break as of the 21st of December, what are your hopes that this legislation is going to pass in time to give you the relief that you and the others in your community deserve? Honestly, hope is all we have at this landfill right now. I mean, it is the one thing we hold on to, and we're trying to remain optimistic. This was a bipartisan effort. We'll see how bipartisan this effort really is. We'll see if everyone who signed that legislation really meant it, because right now what they ought to be doing is they ought to be pulling in their allies. And certainly there are a lot of allies with this issue in Congress on both sides. The Democrats can pull their allies And frankly, since we're talking about taking this site from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Republicans, given the spill in Colorado, there should be some ammunition there. But unfortunately, what's happening and and what we're most concerned of is the PR effort that's been launched. I've seen tremendous pushback by Republic Services, which are the owners of Westlake. They've been framing this that they are the victims and that giving this to FUSREP and the Army Corps of Engineers is a terrible idea that's going to cost money and put people at risk and blah de blah de blah They even put together a social media site that I saw which allowed people to just put in their name and address and there was an automatic message on that that went directly to representatives and the senators saying, oh, please don't pass this legislation. It's a horrible idea. In other words, all of Republic's talking points. What kinds of things, including and beyond this, have you been dealing with in the PR battle? One of the tactics they're using is your classic divide and conquer tactic because we do have other sites in St. Louis that have the same radioactive waste and are currently under control of food threat and being remediated and health effects there. And then we have Westlake, which is under EPA, which if this legislation passed, it would move to food threat. And one of the things they're saying is, well, you know, 
you're taking away from their cleanup by passing legislation here at FoosWrap. And they're trying to take two groups of moms who are working as hard as we can and are so emotionally involved in this issue. We've had loved ones that have died and friends, and they're trying to pit groups against each other with drama that really doesn't exist. It's a very frustrating tactic, but the truth is we always knew that once this legislation was introduced, we would see these tactics. It's very discouraging to the people that are reading and seeing it because they do feel under attack, but it's hard to explain that that's because we're winning. Of course, because they would not be getting this angry or hysterical if you had not made the progress with the visibility that you have to break this story out in the public. It's no longer in parentheses. It's gone national. It's actually gone international because the whole world is watching what is happening in St. Louis. In terms of the group's being put against each other, and I think you were referring to the moms groups around another site that didn't want to have resources taken away from their cleanup to come here because there are so few resources available. Is that accurate? No, I do not believe so at all. That group, in fact, every ounce of data comes out of that group about illnesses or about how bad this waste is and what it does when people are exposed does nothing but strengthen what we're dealing with here at Westlake in stating, look, you know, it's, it's in some ways it's our future. It's saying, look what happened there and was allowed to happen and what they're finding and what this has done to people, you know, and then here we have a fire approaching radioactive waste here and the possibility, however remote, of some sort of release, you know, it does nothing but strengthen why we need the Army Corps at this site, why we need the experts, and why we need to make sure that this fire never hits this radioactive waste. The hardest thing is it's heartbreaking because people belong to both of these groups. This is not a separate cause. There are two sites that need different things done to them and are under different jurisdictions, but they're the same waste. And because of the way the community is in St. Louis, Many people who grew up there live here and vice versa. It's only a couple of miles away from each other. So really what you're going to find is you're going to find an area where this waste overlaps with Westlake. It's almost like if I could use the term cross-contamination, and that is an age-old tactic, and it is something that we were ready for. But you have to remember that there is such an emotional component to people who have lost children, and they're seeing this be used against them. And it's, you know, they're they're very sad and heartbroken by it today. But in the coming weeks, I think it's going to make them angry and more determined. The unity that I have seen from the various sites on Facebook, for example, really heartened me because there seems to be an element of communication and mutual respect and support that's coming out. And none of the backbiting that the other side likes to try and feed between the groups because there might be minute differences in perspective. So what's coming across is that this is a movement that is powered tremendously by mothers on behalf of their children, their families, that it is coordinated between people in slightly different areas who have the exact same concern, and now it's starting to make waves, certainly with this attempt at legislation. I don't know how fast Congress can move on it, but that would certainly be something that we're going to be watching here on Nuclear Hot Seat. It just seems like you are making progress so that, of course, the other side doesn't like to lose. And uh, they will probably get dirtier and dirtier as time goes on. Yeah, they were baiting us on Twitter this week quite a bit. You know, they would like for us to swing at the other group. I think that they'd forget. You know, it's almost comical at the same time. And then it's like, oh, how low can you go? You know, people have lost children from this. People have lost loved ones and relatives. We're watching our best friends die and wither away from autoimmune illnesses. If they think for one minute that we're going to swing at each other, they're wrong. It's not going to happen. 
it is so big what has happened in St. Louis with this legacy that one group cannot handle the whole situation. There are so many moving pieces about, you know, testing and remediation of different areas and then what's happening with Westlake and the fire. These groups were set up the way they are so that we could focus on all of these issues and overlap in the areas where we overlap, which is we've all been exposed to the same Manhattan Project waste and stay separate where we need to stay separate, which is this park has this many Pico Curies per gram and needs to be cleaned up to this. Westlake has this going on. This was designed this way because otherwise there's no way we could stay on top of it if it were all one big picture. I look at it as spokes on a wheel. What are the plans moving forward? Do you have people on your side who are handling the media PR campaign on behalf of you, the mom, the family, the concerned citizens who have been exposed to this waste? Do you have any actions planned? We have a tribunal occurring next week with Lois Gibbs from Love Canal flying in and some of our religious leaders where we're going to have a sort of United Nations tribunal where we're going to get up and testify as to what life has been like, what exposure to radioactive waste and nuclear weapons waste does, personal testimonies, and um, we're hoping to live stream that. And I don't have the date right now. It, It literally has just slipped my mind. It's been that busy of a day. But we're looking for a court stenographer so that our testimonies will speak for us. When it comes to PR, we cannot match them money for money, dollar for dollar. We can't match them. But our personal testimonies speak volumes and touch people that their money just simply can't buy and can't touch. So we're looking at the possibility of maybe doing commercials or ads or whatnot. But, again, you got to remember, we are literally just moms. So that is an area where if people who are listening would like to get involved in, that's something we could always use help with, you know, because we really are being beaten up PR-wise here. And unfortunately, every time we swing back, it's energy devoted to doing just that instead of focusing on this issue. Fighting a PR campaign is very expensive, but it's also very emotionally taxing. Meanwhile, we still have to fight to get this bill passed. So that is something that the listeners can help with as well. We need people to call up the people that sit on these committees. And I'll tell you, if you're listening and you have been affected by this type of nuclear weapons waste or any of these, I would really encourage you to call. You can get on our website, stlradwastelegacy.com, and pull up the people on these committees. They need to understand that mistakes have been made at this site, and they need to understand from those of you that have been through it before at other sites what happens and what's at stake. We need your help with this. It's going to come down to sheer number of phone calls. Nuclear Hot Seat will, of course, have your list again of the congressional representatives and your two senators. We have that on the site under episode number 227, and it will be under this episode number 232, because this is not a political issue. This is a public health issue. And if or when that fire hits that radioactive waste, which is bad enough all by itself. But with the inclusion of that fire, I don't know if anybody's taken into account the farmlands in the area, what that would do to crops, what that would do to the rest of St. Louis, what that would do to the Mississippi River. There are so many different ways that this could play out with enormous consequences that some eye-opening on the part of the media, I think, would go a long way towards giving you the leverage you genuinely need to get this bill passed, get the attention paid, and maybe get some investigation into the EPA and up what orifice they have stuck their heads to have been this incompetent for this long in such a serious situation. No, you're absolutely right, and I'm convinced that that's part of the problem. The amount of mistakes at this site are so enormous, and each mistake has its own consequence. And I think that is what the Environmental Protection Agency, and for that matter, the federal government is worried about. This site really was that mishandled, and so many things have gone wrong at this site besides the fire that's going on right now. We do not yet really fully understand this site, and EPA will tell you that. They're currently characterizing the radioactive waste. Although they've had the site for 20 years, 
they're going back to the very beginning and recharacterizing the site because they know they got it wrong. You cannot do more starting from scratch than that. I mean, that is literally starting at the very beginning. What do we know about this site? Where is it all? What is it? And before you go saying what the risk is to the community and the surrounding area, you know, you have no business as ATSDR coming in and saying there's not a public health threat when admittedly you don't know what's there and how much of it. That is another key problem that we're seeing here. And unfortunately, these people around this community are smart. As you can see from the Facebook page, they have done their homework. And they can read, they can see through this ridiculousness. And unfortunately, it puts one more agency on their list of agencies that they don't trust. And so we have this problem going now of all these people and all these mistakes at this site, and they're still accumulating. The Army Corps of Engineers and the FUSRAP, they're not perfect by any means, but they're the best that we have. And we have to get them up on this site to take a look at it and at least tell us how bad it is and what we have. We don't even have that now. And meanwhile, the fire continues to burn and the waste is still there and nothing has been moderated. Dawn, I appreciate you taking the time out on this extremely busy day. I don't know that you have anything other than extremely busy days lately. We're going to be in touch and I've just learned that I am going to be able to go out to St. Louis. It's just a matter of figuring out an appropriate time and booking the ticket. So I will be having a chance to meet you in person, seeing the site, and seeing what I can do there to be of service. To you and the moms. And the kids and everyone who is there. Well, we are very excited at the prospect of you coming out. You know, we call ourselves accidental activists at this point. It just kind of fell in our lap. And we don't turn away help because we can't afford to. We're living here, and it really is that serious of a situation. We get that, and you guys are doing a brilliant job. Don't ever call yourself just mom, because moms are the miracle workers of the world, and you guys are doing so much up over and above what a normal mom has to do. But you've got the respect of the world, and there's support out there. You're calling it to you, and we will do everything in our power to assist you in getting some kind of resolution on this situation no matter how long it takes. Thank you, Levy. For now, thank you for again being my guest this week, Dawn Chapman, on Nuclear Hot Seat. Dawn Chapman, who refers to herself as just a mom, lives within two miles of the Westlake Landfill and is admin for the Facebook site Westlake Landfill. If you haven't friended that site yet, you need to do so. Activist shout-outs. Yay! And a standing ovation to two high school seniors, Carolyn and Margaret. I don't know their last names or I'd let you know them. But Carolyn and Margaret produced a video on Westlake called Forbidden Knowledge, and they did it as a project for their English class. This video is a powerful edit of clips, individual interviews, personal stories, and archival footage. Really ambitious and very well done. You know, it makes me sorry that the Physicians for Social Responsibility Film Competition for Young Filmmakers has concluded for this year. But maybe next? The top prize was $5,000. We'll have forbidden knowledge up on the website nuclearhotseat.com, either on the videos page or under this episode number 232. Here's today's final thought, and it is clearly the most important final thought I have ever offered on this show. Two weeks ago, I made a mistake on this program. I singled out an activist for criticism, something I've never before done. I took the information that I based this criticism on from a story I read in Japan Times and some direct messages I received from other people. Those were my sources. But I did not take the time and do the research I should have done, and I deeply overstepped both propriety and taste. So my apologies to you, Dana Dernsford, for having spoken out inappropriately. You are clearly a motivated, passionate, 
anti-nuclear activist dedicated to the work in your own unique way. I did not mention you by name previously because I wanted to avoid focusing on personality over principle. But at this point, I think we both know how well that worked. I hope you can find it in your heart to grant forgiveness, as I agree to turn a blind eye to the responses you and others have presented as a result of what I said. Know that I have re-edited my previous nuclear hot seat to remove the offending material wherever possible. This has led me to realize that a movement, our movement, has at least four different component parts, all of which are valuable and each of which has to operate within its own framework of logic. The first are the scientists, engineers, researchers, and epidemiologists. These people have to maintain a studied neutrality when it comes to politics if their research and reports are to be taken seriously in the larger world. So though they are doing research that supports anti-nuclear positions as the only sane approach to energy in the world, in order to retain their credibility in front of institutions and agencies that would love to tear them down, these people will never take an overt, blatant anti-nuclear stance. Second, the existing anti-nuclear groups, which have created an infrastructure for communicating with the governmental bodies that, like it or not, govern and regulate or fail to regulate the nuclear industry. These groups do the hard-ass work of slogging through Nuclear Regulatory Commission calls and agency meetings, deciphering intentionally dense languaging, preparing action guides, and interacting with the people who right now have the genuine power to support or sink the entire nuclear industry. And we know which way these agencies usually go. These groups also regularly ask for action from the general public to support their work and positions, petitions to sign, phone calls to make, showing up at demonstrations. They need numbers to do things like register comments on the NRC site when pieces of garbage like the recent hormesis petitions show up or when calls are needed to governmental offices. The third group are the communicators, people with podcasts, Google Hangouts, email lists, and, yes, YouTube channels. Those of us who package the information and try to point people in the direction of making a difference. We can't count on mainstream media to have our backs, so some of us have stepped into the fray to try and pass along the information, digging into it where we can, as deeply as we can, and translating industry gobbledygook into normal English when we have to, so that what we've found can be generally understood. Number four are those people who are outside of organizations, people who have the awareness, the fury, the power, and the passion to respond to the nuclear menace. This group would be represented by a lot of the people who have so kindly shared their opinions of me in the past two weeks. These are individuals who, in their own way, take action that's not necessarily connected to a larger organization or a structure. What they do is good, but their work deserves to be so much bigger, stronger, more visible to the larger world so that it can make the difference that you intend it to do. So, Dana, imagine, just imagine, how much more effective we can be if we blend this alternative YouTube social media savvy anti-nuclear community that follows you so closely with the establishment anti-nuclear community. What might we be able to accomplish as a movement if we could connect these two not in criticism but in cooperation? I can tell you it's the last thing those pro-nukers would want. I bet we could rapidly solidify into a unified anti-nuclear community that's a real force to be reckoned with. Now clearly, Dana, you've spurred a lot of people to take action. You're obviously a highly inspirational leader. What would happen if we figured out how to coordinate and connect our actions in a productive way, 
so that the world can't not hear about the anti-nuclear stance. We need to figure out how to be one solid unified force against nuclear based on the recognition that we're all on the same side. For now, Dana, once again, I offer you my apologies. You and I might even have a further conversation to reconcile our differences and maybe even make some plans. It's not impossible. But I'll be honest. As long as certain videos and their comment streams remain online, I'm afraid that our conversation is not going to happen. So I invite you to step back from the firing line and take this as an opportunity to turn the can of worms I opened into some vermiculture composting. Help turn this unfortunate experience into something of ultimate value that can nourish this movement, our movement, into becoming something greater than the sum of its very different parts. The opportunity is there. The ball's in your court. I encourage you to go for it. Peace. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 1, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, stltoday.com, bigbendnow.com, kuer.org, usnews.com, washingtontimes.com, penlive.com, knoxblogs.com, Erica Gray and Beyond Nuclear, wrvo.org, ksdk.com, kicknuclear.com, skynews.com, buzzfeed.com, westernadvocate.au, bbc.co.uk, rt.com, asahishimbun.com, nhkworld, japantimes.co, asahi Com, the misguided fools damaging their karma at World Nuclear News and the World Nuclear Association, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to like and stop blocking. Big thanks this week to Lonnie Clark, Byron DeLear, Sean Arklight, Ian, Chuck, and Joyce Joyce, we get to rejoice, for your many examples of generosity of spirit and help with the stories. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly the Veterans Truth Network. Now we are syndicated in New Zealand by NewsSentinel.com. The show is also available on iTunes under podcasts, and the archive is available on the website NuclearHotSeat.com on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that the periodic table of elements uses PU for the element plutonium because, and this is true, the scientists wanted you to know how bad it was, and that's why they called it PU. See, we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.